All right, guys. Well, welcome to the show. Thanks for waiting. Those of you that have been here the whole time, we had to watch the end of that basketball game to get it going. If you're just tuning in, thanks for being here, guys. And I've got a new AD, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. If you guys didn't watch my show yesterday, basically the way I feel is I was always in wait and see mode about the AD. There wasn't really an AD out there like a head coach or a, or a coordinator that I was rooting for that I had my eyes on. I think with the AD at Texas A&M, it's been a tough gig, not much stability. It's been a revolving door. I needed to see I need to see it over time. But as far as Trub Alberts go, I think mostly positive. I, I don't see many negatives to acquiring Trev Alberts to be leaving his alma mater where he won the butt kiss, where he was a consensus all American. I don't see any glaring negatives or weaknesses to this move. I, I don't I don't see the red flags here. So that's my biggest positive from it. I, it seems like everything he's done, I don't think any single thing he's done has been overwhelmingly great. I mean, I hear the biggest gripe is that Nebraska didn't win anything when he was there. But it does seem like Nebraska's in a much better place than where he found it. And his tenure there was quite short. I think he got there in 2001. Nebraska dealing with some instability internally. They haven't hired a president for, I think, going on seven months now. And I think that's one of the key reasons why he left. But a &M gets him. And, you know, he has a few accomplishments. Hired Matt Rule. That was looked at as a great hire. It looks like the football program has finally bottomed out and is rebounding. The latest thing they've done is flipped Dylan Rayola. Uh, I know he's a legacy, but you still had to get it done. They finished top 20 in recruiting. They have much more hope going into next year. It does feel like Nebraska's turned a corner. They they're they're doing a four hundred fifty dollar four hundred fifty million dollar renovation on their stadium this year. Program looks good. I believe there's some work being done on their practice facilities too. I think there's a lot of a lot of positive momentum within their football program, and that was a tough job to inherit with how down they were under Scott Frost and how down they've been since moving to the Big Ten. Before that, Nebraska of Omaha. The main thing out of there is what he did to save the athletic department. He had to cut the athletic department's two most popular sports in wrestling and football in order to save the greater good, in order to save the entirety of the athletic department that was in financial shambles, that was maybe not looking like it was going to have a future at all. They changed leagues, and the league that they, they, they moved into, it featured the other sports more so than football and wrestling. It was a basketball and hockey primarily league. And to this day, Nebraska of Omaha is good. So he left both. That, that was a very controversial decision. I think other people will give you other reactions to that news, but I look at it as a tough decision that he made. That was a positive decision. I think another controversial to some decision was the $450, $450 million renovation he's doing on the stadium or he enacted on the stadium happening this year, Nebraska's football stadium. Many were looking at it as a weird time to pour so much money into the football program. Many academic types were looking at it as a weird thing to do at a time when certain studies were getting cut, certain cuts were being done to the athletic, to the academic side of things while football was getting poured this money. But to counter that, you're looking at a new era of football where you have to compete in this new name, image, and likeness transfer portal type of football environment. It's a tough decision. It's a decision that was met with criticism, but I mean, we're here, we're, we're into athletics. It makes sense to get ahead of the curve in that regard. I don't know how much money you're going to have going forward. Now you have to pay so many players. So maybe it's good that they're doing it now than later. Regardless, I, I don't see the negatives with Trev. I think it's positive. I'm happy with it. I, I, I'm not blown away. I, I'm not here saying it's a guaranteed win. I'm in wait and see mode, but I think overall positive. So I want to hear what you guys have to say. Let's see what I think uh, Gary Mertens had a, had, a, had a note on it. It's a good hire, says Gary. He has a good track record. Make no mistake, he's a climber. Having Big 12 and SEC, SEC experience will flesh out his resume, in my opinion, two to five years. Now, my counter to that is with the potential that A&M has as an athletic department, especially football, and then I think even basketball and definitely baseball. There's, there's way more untapped potential in all three of them. Can this place not be a destination for an AD? Can this not be the 
pinnacle of earning for an AD. Can A&M not become that if it sees success over a long-term period of time under his tenure? Can this not be a destination? Or do you do you think he climbs above? I mean, what's above A&M? I, I think right now there are places above A&M. But I think if you cultivate and grow A&M, A&M can become as competitive as anywhere across the board. Which leads me to just some comments on A&M's athletic department as a whole right now. It really feels like A&M overall is going through some transition right now. I mean, when you transition football from the Jimbo era to an entire new coaching staff into this new era of football, 12-team playoff for now, that's changing. NIL, transfer portal, everything in flux, everything in motion. You add a new coach. Really, truly a new era of football for the entire country, but specifically for schools that have gone through overhauls right now in the middle of this thing. a and doing that. New AD, we just talked about it. Trev Alberts, big transition. New man at the helm, new philosophies, new relationships, new everything. That's the very top, and football is right there with it. Both changed. Baseball, finding newfound success at a level that we haven't seen in a long, long time. I mean, Schloss has been here for a few years now, but Schloss is starting to feel like a, a true Aggie. Being on that committee to find the new AD, being part of the crew that landed Trev Alberts, building that relationship. I'm sure he was involved in some capacity. Shalas could be a guy that leads us into the future too. And with the success he has here and what we think the potential of the baseball program is with hopeful renovations to the stadium and the ability to get athletes like Braden Montgomery out of the portal to recruit the way he's been recruiting. I mean, it feels like maybe baseball's turning a page as well. That leaves what we just watched, basketball. And something that Trev Alberts did before at Nebraska was display patience in his basketball program. Fred Hoiberg, the coach at Nebraska for basketball in Trev Alberts' time there, he won about 25 combined games in his first three years at the helm of the basketball program. Trev Alberts stayed the course, and this year Hoiberg won Big Ten defensive coach, oh, sorry, Big Ten coach of the year. Nebraska is a tournament team. Turned it around. Let him build his culture and let him have his time. Now, Buzz. I know a lot of people are out on Buzz. I don't think I'm out on Buzz. I really like what Buzz does for the culture. I like what he does for the for the men, for the basketball players. Hasn't always translated. The teams have not been consistent. The personnel stuff has been weird with. Marble this year and Coleman. I don't know what happened to Coleman. But I think you give it time and you give it a little bit more investment. I still believe in Buzz. I'm not getting rid of Buzz after this year. And maybe Trev Alberts feels the same way. Maybe he can work some of the same magic he worked in Nebraska in their basketball program here at AM. I don't know how you guys feel about that. I know a lot of people are out on Buzz. I really like Buzz Williams, the person. But I can't ignore the fact that A&M has been having breakdowns midseason seemingly every year. Jeb and I were talking about it in the pre-show. Felt like this was going to be a really good year for Aggie basketball. So many guys coming back besides like Dexter, but the rest of the team coming back and then for some of them to disappear. Boots maybe taking a step back. Just lapses, decision-making problems, weird stuff. So I don't know where you go. I, I see both sides, but I'm leaning towards keeping Buzz, and hopefully Trev does too, in my opinion. Just mentioned baseball. Huge weekend this weekend, opening SEC play versus Florida, who was a very much hyped team going into the year. I think they started ranked four. They're now 10-6, and six, but make no mistake, a and is going to get Florida's best shot this weekend at home to open SEC play. But if a and can go out there and win the series or sweep – you better believe we're going to start believing. I'm already starting to believe, although pitching has been shaky the last couple of games. But the offense will keep you in any game. We'll be looking out for that. Jeb, how was the baseball game last week? You went on Friday or Thursday, didn't you? I want to hear from Jeb. I want to hear how the baseball game was. All right. Couple of cryptic tweets of the night. Cryptic tweets of the night, a segment brought to you by nobody. And these aren't even cryptic. These are just tweets, but I like the title, so we're going to keep it that way. First one is from the new AD. Yes, the new AD has a Twitter. He's already all in. 
Look at that handle. Look at those images. Look at that profile picture. From one day to the next, this man is all Aggie. And yes, he is getting so much freaking hate from Nebraska. He was a Nebraska guy. Obviously, we know. Butkus winner. He was their AD. He was in the state for the last almost 20 years. Now the next day, he's an Aggie. He's getting all the hate in the world, but he's getting love from us. And this is a move that, you know, Aggies like to see this. It's just, it's just a feel-good thing. And retweeting Johnny. Johnny said, this is all I needed to hear, talking about Will Compton's comments on Nebraska losing Trev to A&M and A&M's oil money. Maybe truth to that. But he's pretty upset, and that made Johnny believe. And then Trev Alberts retweeted him. You'll love that interaction. Love to see it. Another cryptic tweet. Ruben Owen's dad talking about Ruben Owen's size. He's 208 right now. He plans to be 210 to 215 when fall starts, still keeping his speed and elusiveness. I would love to see a 215-pound Ruben Owens come fall that has kept his speed and elusiveness. And I love that that's the mentality. You don't want to just pour on the weight the wrong way. You want to keep it and stay quick. Just a cool tweet that I saw on the comments of, who was this, Layden, Landon's, the, the Rivals guy. In the comments of Landon's tweet, and this is really cool stuff. And on the note of development, we got Solomon Williams looking like an absolute beast. You, this, is this guy look like a college freshman to you? I mean, he's looking like a monster. And I know these off-season workouts, what do they count for? They don't count for that much. But this dude looks like a freaking junior, and he's not even a freshman. This is a, this is a uh, this is a high school senior in his in his spring semester. He looks big. How much can you draw from it? But it was still cool to see. This is one of those last-minute Elko guys out of Florida that you're just happy to, happy to see getting huge. And then finally, lead me into my last topic before we get into the calls. Where did we go? I guess I lost it. It was a tweet from Pete Thamel, though, announcing that there is a meeting going on that is going to – expand the playoff from 12 to 14 teams before we even saw the 12 team playoff they're expanding it to 14 we heard rumblings about this we thought it might happen it is happening i want to give you guys my thoughts on that and get into the phone calls get to some of the commenters but we've been chilling for a while and i've been drinking water bottles i'm going to run to the restroom we're going to finish the show out be right back guys Sorry about that, guys. You know how this goes. I am three drinks in here, so this is what happens. But anyway, yes, it just got announced today that the playoff is officially expanding from 12 to 14. And, of course, we haven't even seen the 12-team playoff yet. I've been hesitant about this massive expansion for a while, and my reasoning for that has been that I love the college football regular season. I love how much the week-to-week -week means in college football. And it feels like every time the playoff gets expanded, the regular season gets diminished just a little bit. I believe with the 14-team structure, you're looking at the top two seeds getting the bye week, the other 12 teams getting round one games, the top seeds getting home games, the lesser seeds being the away team on that first round. I, it's just weird to me. I understand why you expand. You expand for money. You expand for more big games at the end of the year. That all makes sense to me. But at what point do we start losing what makes college football so special? That's that's what that's what's bothersome to me. My fear is that if you're a three or four seed and you're looking pretty locked in by the end of the year, are you going to be resting players? How hard are you going to be going in these late games in the year? If you're locked into a top seed, a home game in round one, 
do you even play your guys in the last game of the year? Like it's getting to that point where I'm getting a little bit worried about that kind of thing. I have to see it play out. I have to feel how the 12 team feels. We're going to get two years of 12 team playoff. It's weird to me to expand to 14. It, it seems 12 seemed like an arbitrary number two. It felt like four was okay. Eight made sense. 16 made sense. And now we're bouncing between 12 and 14. It only feels like we're eventually going to land on 16 to me. But I worry about the regular season, how every weekend was essentially a de facto playoff game where you basically had to win all your games or at least only lose one. Now you're looking at nine and three in an SEC or Big Ten school being very likely to make the playoff, I would say. If it's 14, maybe 16 teams, I don't know how I feel about that. If you can lose three games in the regular season, we're looking at a different sport. We're looking at the further professionalization of the sport, the NFLization. And I know they say the NFL has the best postseason in sports. To me, college football is the best sport. And I hate to lose what makes it special. But I don't know for sure how that's going to feel. We have to see this thing play out over the next two years. I, I It's such a cop-out for me to say that, but I always say I, I have to feel it before I just snap react to things. Anyway, guys, let's say what's up to everybody in the chat, then we'll get to the callers. So far, I only have Max waiting. If it's just Max tonight, we'll keep it short. We'll get out of here quickly. Thank you guys for being here throughout the offseason. You guys have been awesome. Roly, it's good to see you, man. Been a great game, and I'm out rebounding them offensively and defensively. That's the great thing about AM. Seeing the rebounding, seeing the hustle, just some execution things are, are, are problematic. Gary Mertens, good to see you, man. Jeb, as usual, good to see you. Ronnie Barker out of Tokyo, as always, good to see you, man. John Peroni, as usual, thanks for being here, man. Looks like that's all we have in the commenters. Jeb says. Florida's baseball and softball teams have always been good. Yes, they have. Good athletic school. Jeb had fun at the baseball game. Was it last Friday? It was a blowout, so we didn't stay the entire game. Showed my buddy around Seastead. I'm sure you guys had a great time. Oh, A&M's having a soccer-friendly matchup between, I believe, Brazil and Mexico at Kyle Field this summer. And I think I'm going to go to that. Seems like a nice excuse for a low-pressure sporting night at Texas A&M. That sounds great to me. I'm going to try to make it to that friendly soccer matchup. Tiger Bam Belly Hopper, good to see you. Sorry I missed the start. It's all good, man. We were just watching the end of the basketball game, talking a little bit about the AD, talking a little bit about the athletic department, how it feels like AM's kind of changing eras right now. Have those physical backs. Yeah, man, if Ruben can get a little bit more physical, work on the vision. We know Ruben can be special, man. We've seen some of the open field stuff he can do. I think the guys are on spring break right now. I, I want to say next week or the week after. I, I don't know for sure. It's hard to find the official start date of practice, but we know the game's on the 20th. Solomon Williams is the – I think he's the best candidate for breakout freshman, Jeb. You're so spot on with that. This dude looks ready now. I think he looks more ready than even Dalen Evans. I, I think Solomon is, is ready to contribute right away, and he's a guy that I don't really mention when we talk about the depth chart, but I think he's going he's gonna to make an impact. That's for sure. Yeah, it's going to be just like the NFL, especially if it goes to 16. Tiger says, my thought of Nebraska is pissed. It was a good hire. Yeah, man, yesterday they were sad, and today we're seeing the freaking rage of the Huskers. They're tweeting at him. They're commenting on his A&M tweets. I think he tweeted, like, goodbye to them or something. And they're pissed off, and that bodes well. If they're, if they're holding the door open when they're leaving, it's like, okay, what are you really getting here? But they're not happy. Jeb, I'm with you. Know nothing about soccer, but I'll go. And if it's happening in Kyle Field, I just might be into it. John Prony says he thinks practice starts next week. Okay. My plan for when spring starts is I'm going to go back to that chart that we worked on a couple weeks ago or that 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 uh, list of spring storylines, and I'm going to add to it, and I'm going to make just like a quick streamline, like 20-minute spring watch list video that will come out early next week. So that's the plan right now. Once I get it confirmed, I think you're right, John. I think it starts next week. But I want to put that out right when spring officially starts. But all right, guys, let's get into the callers. Max, sorry to keep your waiting. You're on with Drew. It's good to hear from you, man. How you been? Hey, so sorry I wasn't in the comments. I, the Wi-Fi at my place is a little weird because the, the the folks that own the place, they use business internet for a house. Anyway, Interesting. The, it blocks out YouTube comments, so it, it's oh, weird. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad uh, you could be here in the call-ins. Yeah, so I, I got agenda items today, man, because you think 
the the playoff item is the most interesting thing. Well, I just saw the the news pop up that the remember I was telling you about Dartmouth a couple weeks ago. Yeah, what's going on? Uh, they they voted to unionize and they oh, succeeded. That's right. that's right. And the in the the labor board today uh, certified the election. Wow. So this is the start of maybe a slippery slope, but it's weird that it starts with Ivy League, right? Dartmouth's Ivy League, right? That, I'm right with that. Well, right. here, here's the thing. is It's it's because the the way the laws are set up, the Labor Relations Board cannot uh, govern the, the public institutions. So that was what kind of put Northwestern's remember the Northwestern case about a decade ago with the football players, they were trying to unionize yes. that deflated the case. Cause they were like, well, how are we going to govern the big 10 when like, you're like mostly a public, it's mostly public schools. I think Northwestern's was the only private school in the big 10 at the time. Um, so this is completely different because the Ivy league's all private. Right. And on top of that, the the players were arguing that, hey, we don't get scholarships because we're Ivy League. So we we really should be fighting for compensation because we don't get the same sort of things that a typical Division One athlete would receive. Right. So, but yeah, it definitely is strange, right? That you're like, well, why the Ivy League? But then you look into the, like the, the facts behind the case and the, the situations and the law and you're like, well, of course it would be the Ivy League. So why why so and how can that translate to the rest of the landscape? I mean, I, I really don't know much about the situation. I, I heard about this. I thought it was weird that it's coming from the Ivy League. Who I guess it makes sense, like you said, they don't get any compensation. But what's the slippery slope here? How does it translate? And what specifically are the laws and what makes it interesting? I will say I'm not a legal expert, so don't expect me to like know everything. But I will say is that there is an uh, there's a similar unfair labor practice case going on with usc right now so seeing this outcome and then seeing what's going on with usc also a private school uh not not the not the other usc the usc (laughs) yeah um and whether that succeeds now considering how the labor relations board is currently run I would say it's in their favor, considering the way the the current political system is. We'll see how the cards shuffle in November. Um, but it's hard to say, really, right? Because it's 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 going to come down to a judge, or it's going to come down to who who runs the White House or Congress. All these sorts of factors are unpredictable. Yeah. But the current system, if it were to hold this fall would be in favor of more of these cases going the way of the athletes right? and more sliding the system away before the, the game has a chance to govern itself. Right. And I'm broadly in favor of players having the ability to bargain for rights, but I don't like the way that this is going to completely chop up any sort of consistency in any sort of structure to the game. It's going to make it a complete wild west. <sighs> yeah. It, that's how it feels like it's going, right? Like players are going to become employees. I mean, that's that's what's going. It's eventually going to come to this. But when you say it's not going to be an even playing field, it's going to be more so the wild wild west. Expand on that. Because the it's uh, only certain athletes can even unionize right. for starters under that system. Okay. So others would have to go about a different way and there would probably would involve lawsuits for a lot of public schools, for example. Right. And then on top of that, we have, in addition to the actual employment situations, employment suits, unfair labor, labor practices, unionization efforts, you have the house case against the NCAA, which is looking for back pay for NIL for a bunch of athletes uh, in the billions of dollars. Uh, and that's going forward to a judge who has ruled in the past on some other NCAA cases uh, against the NCAA, by the way. So we will see what happens there. There's there's a lot of different forces that have power over different things in different parts, parts of the country or different institutions that are going to try to put 
to enforce their will on the game, but none of them have control over everything. So it's going to be inconsistent. Right, right. Man, this kind of sucks. I mean, I, I, I believe event eventually we're going to reach structure and we're going to reach a level playing field, but it really feels like the next 10 years are going to be all over the place. So, man, I'm glad you're keeping up with that stuff because for me, I'm still living in, in fall. I still, I, I still care about the game. I still want to be at the game. I'm still, I still try to keep a narrow focus because that's what I love about the game, but that stuff, it's unavoidable. But, Max, I want to hear what you have to say about the AD. Thanks for bringing that stuff up. It needed to be, it needed to be put out in the air. But I want to hear what you think about Trev Alberts to A&M. <clears throat> so I'm digesting because apparently there is uh, – did you, did you read the athletic article from the Beat Reporter for Nebraska about the hire? Because they, they, the, the athletic wrote an article about it. And apparently there was some shady uh, bookkeeping – practices that the uh alberts had while he was at omaha really which yes i Uh, I didn't see that part yeah so from the flatwater free press they had a investigative report back in november about it um and however at the same time even with the shade i mean the 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 whatever sort of shady accounting practices happened there are like a rounding error for, you know, office supplies or whatever <laughs> at, you know, Nebraska Lincoln. So I'm not sure it really matters to anyone that's hiring an AD at right. A&M. But it's still like, there's your one thing you can point and be like, what's the one questionable thing that guy has ever done? It's that. Right, right. I mean, he, um, has, his fair, he has his share of criticism, as most ADs do, but I, 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 I don't see anything as – a lingering negative that could transfer to his time at A&M, really. I, I don't think, but I guess anything's possible. We don't know how it's going to play out. It's good to yeah. know that stuff. Yeah, it's just good. I want the. I, I like to put the whole picture because that's my one negative item before I'm about to pump a lot of sunshine. So. Sure, sure. Yeah, you got to do that. that. That makes sense. Yeah, you're smart. Okay. You're smart when you get on the airwaves. You know what you're doing. All right, Max. Yeah. So here, here's here's the sunshine, right? Mm-hmm. First off, has the guts to make a firing that, even though it was popular financially, would be uh, not so popular, especially at Nebraska, where uh, if you also read the the athletic article, I keep citing them a lot because you know the the beat writers who are salaried there do great journalistic work. Um, the their legislative picture right now for funding the university not so good yeah uh they might have a good athletic budget but they the university as a whole is suffering um which is why they still don't have a president by right. the way they, right. they've been taking like what seven or eight months to hire a president yes, yes. that's not good no I mean, I know A&M hired their interim, but their our interim was overly qualified to be an interim. Right. Um, right. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't, if they if they're gonna. It was almost funny. It was when I when I saw they hired Welsh. I was like, when you look down and you're like, wait, this guy did what? And he did what? Surely yeah. they're just gonna end up hiring this guy. And they right. did. Um, Nebraska is not in that same position. And on top of that, they the president that left them went to went to Ohio State. And then hired Bjork away. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just it's just funny how that that chain kind of kind of works out. Yeah. Um, but in terms of some other positive signs, right? Obviously, he hires Rule. He he sticks with Hoiberg because even though the the, the program's down in the dumps, he the process was correct. Right. And there were other institutional problems that had been, you know, with Nebraska for, you know, 70, 80 years that have prevented them from being a competitive basketball program. You have the story about volleyball day. Yep. All those sorts of things are, are massive pluses. Sure. So now you're moving here and the first thing that comes up, we talk about buzz. Yep. I think I think he'll he's going to just do wait and see like a lot of ADs do when they first step on the job. I mean, I I can't right. think of that many ADs that fire Jump a coach fire. Yeah. within the first before the the end of their first year. Right. Unless there was some co- uh, firing for cause situation. Um, right. But I have to say that, I mean, 
even if you guys make the final, the tournament this year of this SEC tournament, I mean, you're probably still not making the 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 64 or the 68 or whatever. Right. We just won the first game of the SEC tournament, but we need to pr- pretty much get to the championship game to make that tournament. And that's even it, not a guarantee. It, I would not bet. I mean, you're, you're finished lower. You did the same thing two years ago and you still didn't make it. We probably have to win the championship to make it. That's yeah. probably what it yeah. is. Most likely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, and that, that's auto bid. So by default, yeah. but yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But so I would not, I mean, number one, I wouldn't bet on that happening because that'd be amazing luck. Right. right. Cause no, it's, to, to to finally peak at the end of the season like that after all that suffering, but almost happened last year, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) I I think you got to give them a year and then you got to look at yourself and realize, Hey, buzz has been declining ever since he left Marquette for like a while. Like, I don't know whether it's this, the bigger ACC, SEC leagues are not the right kind of fit for his identity as a coach, but his, he is not as successful as he was at Marquette and he has never quite been able to repeat that formula. He's had like, he had like one outburst at Virginia tech, but he's never been the same. Yeah, it's fair. Yeah. So maybe you just need to say, Hey, look, you, you're a good coach. You're a good guy, but you're not a fit for a large, public institution and a massive football conference like the sec or the acc you need to go to a basketball you need to go back to the big east so what um, in your opinion like what is the what should a and m's goal be with the personality that they hire the kind of guy they hire i mean should they be looking to maximum investment attract these one and done players don't care too much about culture and development as much like buzz seems like he's very much a personal development kind of guy a long-term development kind of guy what do you think i mean what's what's kind of the more go-to for an a and M? I don't think you can be a one and done school unless you're you have a, a calipari or right or a, or your duke or whatever but i think you can you can play to your brand and you say hey we're a massive public institution with a massive fan following let's try to to go bigger with our with our player talent pool let's try to actually you know push to be on the top instead of you know only trying to like oh we have this roster that's talented but like nobody really stands out as like a this guy is going to be a has the potential to be a starter for on an nba team right and also we like I can't remember the last time A and M like maybe I guess Robert Williams, but like the last time A and M like developed somebody like that into an NBA starter. Robert Williams potential... and Alex Caruso, but they're on the same team, so it was all happening at the same time. Yes. Yeah. So, I, f- I feel like that you got to get on that talent development thing as well as well as you know culture, quote unquote. But yeah, if, yeah. if you have culture, but your players aren't becoming better and becoming a more elite team over time and you're just constantly treading water then what is culture really even amount no, to yeah that's exactly this? what's happening it's exactly what's happening i mean the culture stuff whatever that means like you said quote unquote the development's not there this team based on the players we had returning if they would have taken the next step we expected much more we expected a yeah. lot more and it just didn't happen we just didn't see the development of of, of guys we saw guys disappear so yeah, you're exactly and it's, right. It's, it's not the first time they've disappeared either, and it's right. and it, sure you can say the play. It's not the coach's fault the players are missing shots, but it is the coach's fault that he that he brought in those players. <laughs> That's so fair. That's fair, but I mean, how so, much? I mean, I mean, the coach is all, the coach is one factor in bringing in players. So is everything A and M has to offer for a basketball program. And most people will tell you that A and M is behind infrastructure and facilities wise for basketball. So that's also an attracting force that's not here at A and M right now. And maybe, maybe you need buzz, maybe, maybe you need to coach the rally the resources like yeah sure sure in that's basketball. Fair. Maybe that's another thing you need to focus on. And because... that's something that Buzz doesn't do. He's not vocal about that. And an example of someone who is is Jim Schlossnagel is very vocal about it. And it sounds like we're getting or we were getting close to some sort of announcement to renovations to baseball. And you know, new AD now. We'll see where that goes, but. That's a very, very valid point that maybe you need someone to push the department in that regard. And goodness knows that A&M already has a world-class ballpark for a college baseball team. So, I mean, 
I, I got I got to walk by that a ton whenever I was doing summer. Uh, I keep forgetting what the the apartment complex on West Campus is called. It's owned by the university because I only was there for a summer, but I was there, nice. and I was going by that a ton. Yeah, um, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, in addition to to the, I was going to get back to the women's volleyball thing because A and M's kind of go, has some positive direction there for again, you know, the women's basketball team, their new coach, yep. uh, Joni Joni Taylor, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah, she's been incredible, honestly. I mean, look at what the fight they put up against South Carolina yep. in the tournament. Yep. Imagine if he could direct some resources to the women's basketball team like that he did with women's volleyball. And, you know, obviously promote women's volleyball too, you know. That sport is really underrated on what kind of potential it could have as a revenue sport, at least if you're a massive public school. Because you can, you can build a hype campaign around that and you fill stadiums for you know one-offs like that you see it wasn't just nebraska that did that iowa had like forty thousand oh, nice. for for their stadium game it's just kind of a thing that schools are doing in the midwest but the south hasn't decided to catch on maybe trev can change that it's a really good point yeah it makes a lot of sense and on top of that i mean clearly trev is good at raising money just overall for the school and getting things done getting construction projects done convincing that investing in facilities is important and i know a and m is already has plenty of good facilities but there's sometimes there's going to be fatigue from not even donors but the actual administration is like hey where our budget isn't right here or there and you got to say, okay, fine, we can, we can fix that because we're just going to keep rallying better donors and we'll spend more intelligently instead of, you know, paying coaches way too much money based on one national championship run a little while ago yeah, (laughs) or whatever, or, you know, this guy having a bunch of March madness runs with a different school that, and, but then he doesn't actually fit the identity of this school or this program at all. I like Buzz, uh, unless he turns it around, well, it seems to be heading that direction. Yep, unfortunately, yep. So there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. At the same time, I do not love Matt Rule. I've never been a Matt Rule guy. So I do not like that hire for Nebraska, and I think their fans are way out of it thinking they're going to finish 9-3 and in the Big Ten next year. Is that what they're thinking? Yes. Ooh, yeah, they're not there yet. I mean, they're going to be starting a true freshman. I mean, at quarterback, I mean, I don't know much about them, but it feels like they're a couple years away from that kind of a hope. It feels like that's a year three or four kind of a thing. And I don't know, what did you like about Matt Rule? Uh, I just, I don't like the way he, he, it wasn't just that his team was bad at Carolina. It was how he ran Carolina was a disaster. Okay. And then on top of that, his teams at Baylor and Temple, it's not like he he strung together a bunch of consecutive good to great seasons. It was like one explosive season down year, explosive season. Yeah. If you can't build consistency at a program, then all you're doing is you're saying, I can shuffle talent together and have a great year. I can't actually change the identity of this program. Yeah. That's what you need to be as a coach is yeah. you need to be able to, to enforce an identity. And he's never stuck around long enough to enforce one. And even whenever he's been there for more than two or three years, when he's been there for four years, he still does not have any sort of consistency over time. It's just like, oh, I'll explode one year, and then we lose all our talent. Oh, no, our seniors went off to the draft. What are you going to do? I don't know, man. Load up again. Yeah. There's no there's no excuses. This isn't year, year two. Right. So – I just don't – and then on top of that, some of his hiring decisions for assistants were, like, extremely questionable out the gate, and they weren't big-time assistants. But these were – when you saw these hirings, you're like, why are you hiring this obviously questionable guy to be on your off-field staff for recruiting who who was such an obvious reject whenever he worked for the XFL, of all things? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to go down that road, but just say I know things about that guy, uh, right. CJ so anyway not a fan of that process but other than that you have to say he ran nebraska lincoln incredibly well so it's it's got to be a a cautiously optimistic hire for me at this point yep yep that's pretty much where i am too i mean obviously always in wait and see mode pretty much with anything as happy as i am about elko and his staff i'm gonna have to wait and see we're gonna we're gonna prop it up right now because we feel good about it but 
you got to see results. But anyway, while I still have you want a couple more things from you, Max, before I let you go. Just quickly, I know it's not the highlight to you, but what what are your thoughts on the expansion to 14 and kind of bouncing from 12 to 14? Kind of just see to me, it feels like arbitrary numbers. Just go to 16. Why didn't we try eight? It's weird. I know it's money related. What are your thoughts on this expansion before even C12? Well, I think the reason we don't have 16 is because uh, not just money, but a power play. When you're looking at the big two conferences, sure, you could have a couple extra teams in it, or you could control the buys. Right. And sure, even though it's not in in writing that the SEC and the Big Ten are going to control those top two buys, when's the last time a team that is still in the in the SEC and still in the Big Twelve or still in the ACC made a top two? It's Clemson and nobody. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so they don't need it in writing. That was just a leverage play to get more money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It makes sense. So. I'm not I'm not a fan of it, but I kind of at this point I'm like, as you know, who as in my position as an SMU fan, I'm just kind of like we're well positioned to 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 survive on the the waters of whatever, however the tide shifts. Even though it, I'm against how this structure is, yeah. Personally, I would I would have preferred eight, just from a simplicity standpoint. From a let's make the postseason interesting instead of a total popularity contest where no, there's not really any sense of an underdog. Yeah. Unless it's a big boy underdog, like Cardale Jones underdog. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but it's also Ohio state. Right. Anyway. Right. Yeah. So, and then on top of that, you have the most interesting thing was that Notre Dame is not earning a big, anything anywhere near a big two share. It's earning a, a basically the equivalent of a ACC share. Right. Of CFP revenue. And by the way, the ACC is earning a little more than the Big Twelve, so I just get to uh, say screw, screw you, uh, Baylor, uh, TCU, uh, Houston. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's I what still I don't like wanted, you. I also wanted to ask you what your thoughts on the future of SMU and the ACC are. Like, how do you feel about that? And who are y'all's big draws this year? The new teams you're excited to play? Uh, we get the Knolls. Nice. That'll be fun. Where's yep. that? And then, so no, we get the Knolls at home. We, oh, get, nice. we get the Knowles at Ford. So, yeah, we're good. And then on top of that, we get the skillet game at home. So that's good. You know, before TCU runs away like cowards because, you know, <laughs> they don't want to play us now that we're in the Power Five. Right. Um, and then on top of that, uh, in basketball, we get Duke at home and Virginia. Nice. Bunch of cool home games. Damn, that's awesome. I know. the, the Everybody's buying tickets like crazy. We're going to have – everything's going to be sold out, man. It's going to yeah. be incredible. And I've never been, you know, I, this has been a roller coaster ride, like nobody's business. On top of that, we're releasing like construction videos on the, the end zone. They're filling in the end zone with like a massive football operations, hospitality, training building. It's, it's going to be ready by the season. It's going to be ready by the end of July. Yeah. Nice. Man, this and is a they, big it, change. This is awesome. Yeah, there's just, you know, all the all the money that was like, you know, not wanting to contribute to athletics because it's like, what's the point? You know, they'll never let us in. Well, guess what? Yep. <laughs> they just did. There so now now the entire the entire Big 12 just is like, oh, dang it. We, <laughs> we really couldn't we couldn't keep them out. And now uh, y'all will have fun at the wrath of all the rich SMU donors that are like, we have money to spend. So have at it. Yes, sir. So, well, awesome, Max, man. It was good to hear from you, man. Some good stuff from you. Anything you want to say before we close it out tonight? Uh, yeah, you were talking about how the brand of A&M and, like, how, like, you know, Ross left for Ohio State and how you want, you want A&M to be that final destination job. Yes. And I think some of that is achievable. Some of it is hard to achieve for A&M, even if they were completely successful athletically because of the way they are positioned uh, not related to athletics in the state, you know, I I hate saying it, but it is true. Unfortunately that, you know, the shorthorns get two thirds of the money and A&M gets one third Uh, and just stuff like that about political position. So for, if you're someone like Ross Bjork, he's a, he's, he wants to be in front of a camera. He wants to be, 
considered a political power player. Right. So Ohio State for him was not just about athletics, but it was about him having direct, even if he doesn't literally have influence over what's going to happen, he gets to be the face, one of the faces uh, on this new landscape because he's sure. going to get called to Congress or whatever. And as much as I would want Texas A&M to be in that position, unless you have somebody from Texas calling the shots on who, who gets to speak, uh, realistically, A&M is not going to be that institution chosen. And so with that being said, that doesn't mean you can't shoot for the stars. It doesn't mean you can't have an elite athletic program. It just means that if you get someone who's, you know, selfish and arrogant a little bit, you know, like Ross Bjork as your athletic director, you know, maybe they, they won't, even if you do everything right, they're still going to ditch you. And then again, Ross Bjork did a lot wrong. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's been a revolving door. So, I mean, the evidence is there anyway. So yeah, man, we'll see how it goes. I mean, I'm excited for the next four to five years or however long the tenure is. I'm, we'll see how it goes, man. But Max, I appreciate it tonight, man. We went long and it was good stuff. You have a great night, man. I will. I will suffer watching SMU find a way to choke against Temple and basketball, even though they're a terrible basketball team, because SMU basketball is <laughs> it's nothing but suffering ever since the departure of Larry Brown. You never know, man. You never know. All right, Max. Yeah. Have a good night, man. Cheers. Later. That was Max from Spartanburg. All right, we have James and Theo on next. Let's catch up with the chat before we get into them. Roly talking about the soccer match in Kyle Field. I think that would be a good soccer match. Mexico plays Brazil hard every time. I wish I could go. Saving and planning to go to A&M for the Missouri game on October 5th. That's going to be a good one, especially if A&M can escape the first three weeks with one or maybe zero losses and beats Arkansas. That could be a huge game, but beginning of A&M season is just so massive with Florida and then the road game versus – oh, the home game versus Notre Dame, the road game versus Florida. Jeb says, didn't Northwestern football have an issue last year with their coach? Yeah, there was some, uh, I guess, abusive behavior amongst the coach and the players. SB Hustler, good to see you, SB Hustler. 14 team playoffs going to kill our sport. I honestly prefer the BCS. Yeah, man, that's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about losing what was such a precious regular season, the best regular season in sports of college football. Made the sport so special. Every Saturday was a de facto playoff game. And we're kind of losing that. We're looking at nine and three power two teams having, I don't want to say guaranteed, but very likely chances of making a 14 or 16 team playoff, especially 16, obviously, but 14 really opens the door for that. I mean, technically good for programs like A&M who are kind of rebuilding right now. Good for programs like Penn State who are usually right around that range, but just bad for your Saturday to Saturday magic, if you will. Ted's in here. Good to see you. He says, hit those likes. Hit the likes, guys. Ted says to do it, so we got to do it. Appreciate you, Ted. Jeb hitting the hitting the hay early. Good night, Jeb. I know you got early mornings. Gary says he likes Buzz, too. Got to find shooters. That was my thing this year. No shooters. Yeah. It's a good point that he has to find him. He has to find the players for the program. He has to develop them, too. And I say that the coach doesn't really have a play a role in the shooting of the team. Yeah. Shooting slumps, bad shooting days, you don't have the role, but you can find shooters. You can set up a development program over the years that increases your shooting, that improves your shooting. Find a good shooting coach, a good shooting philosophy, if you will, with the development. A good program, I guess that's the right word. Maybe maybe they're trying that, it isn't working. I don't know. Shooting has not been there, and that's a huge factor with the, the way the three ball is so prominent in today's game. Gary says, love hearing the players are working so hard in the weight room. Yeah, guys, if you didn't see the beginning of the show, we showed Ruben Owens' dad talking about how the goal is to get Ruben Owens up to 215 and retain quickness by the time the season starts. That would be awesome to see a 215 Ruben. Max forgot one thing. It was awesome seeing SMU wear, air there. We are coming ACC commercial and SEC network. That is pretty cool. Good for SMU, man. Good to see these Texas schools thriving. All right, we got James from Moody. James, you're on with Drew. What's on your mind tonight, James? James, you with me? Yep. Oh, I, Hello? Hit, I got you now, James. How's it going, man? It's going good, man. I just was thinking about uh, the AD hire. Okay. My thing is, do we need more, like, stadium? 
like I'm sorry, I'm blanking right now. It's my first time being live. No, no worries, man. So what you mean kind of like what are the needs that he can address? Is that kind of what you're getting? At? Yes. Yeah, like do we need uh, you know, Bluebell Park to be, you know, renovated? Because seven thousand being a large and you're seeing other SEC teams putting up twelve thousand people. Yeah. If we could have twelve thousand Aggies at an, a baseball game or, you know, read if we could renovate it to where it can be larger. The twelfth man is our biggest like thing we have. It's our you know what I mean? Yeah, it's our brand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yes, Bluebell Park is beautiful. It's a great stadium. It needs more seats. You're right. Seven thousand a and M can do much better than seven thousand. I think you said twelve thousand. That'd be a great number. There's space in the park for more seats. There's room to improve the overall baseball facilities. Although the, the stadium is very nice, you need more seats. Honestly, I have sentimental value with Reed. I mean, I, I walk the stage in Reed, but if they eventually tore Reed down and rebuilt a stadium, I would not be mad about it. it it's dated. It needs a new look. I don't necessarily know that you need to go bigger with Reed. I think what a lot of pro basketball programs are doing, especially football first basketball, like Baylor, doing, like Baylor, like Texas, like and Baylor, they're they're small. They're pushing everything in, just yes. like what we did with Kyle. Is we pushed everything in, everyone's on top of you, and we just made it louder. It's louder. It's yeah. nicer. It's more intimate. Exactly. Exactly. And I would be totally good with that for Reed. Although with Reed, if you're going to renovate it, I don't know if you can do that. I think you would just be looking at nicer finishes, maybe nicer chairs, a nicer look to Reed. Yeah. If they were to renovate Reed. So I, I think base basketball is probably going to be further down the road. But as far as renovating baseball, I think that's the first move, especially with how the, the program is trending right now. I think you can really justify adding some seats into there. So, I mean, those are some big long-term things we would hope to see from him. And he seems like the kind of guy to get it done. But as far as the day-to-day, -day, the immediate stuff he can do, it's just keep finding avenues for NIL, keep – keep rounding up donors, continuing that push with athletics, getting the top tier players here. Cause you talk to experts, what they're going to say right now is that facilities are now taking a back seat to just NIL money. So yeah, facilities are important. And but, I figure like with Nebraska, they've got some decent NIL, you know, they got some yeah. decent donors, but now that he's got carte blanche, you know, pretty much yeah. when it comes to A&M of uh, the fact of, We've got donors out the wazoo. I mean, you know, nowadays, since we took him, you know, took him, Nebraska fans are always like, oh, he's going for that oil money. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. making his life easier. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I say. And they use that as a dig against us, but it's like, hell yeah, that's that's a factor at play here. That's how we're going to draw people in. I mean, that's the, the sport now. That That's the game now. It's how can you draw people in? And, yeah, the oil money is going to do it. So, yeah, he's going to have to keep pushing that. And that's the statement the president put out was that they like what he stands for in terms of rounding donors and moving into this NIL era of sports. So that's going to be kind of your day-to-day. -day. Then the long-term stuff will be facilities and upgrading all of that. I think there's untapped potential with both basketball, with baseball, with some of the women's sports. I think, I think football's in a really good place, as we know. It, it just comes down to winning with football right now. I think everything is set up for success with football. But if you could get – basketball and baseball even close to that and i think baseball is pretty close you could be looking at a really really good big three at texas a m and you know even uh like revenue wise like he just what he did this year with uh nebraska volleyball mm. you know what i mean yeah, like if he could utilize kyle field oh yeah for like a women's volleyball turn game or something like that yeah and be able to force it that's more revenue for the school and it's more revenue for you know like we don't want to talk about it but the jimbo yeah. contract oh no, yeah it's a factor if if we were able to do stuff like that to fill kyle field more with more revenue then the jimbo jokes go away it's like cool sweet man like we got money coming in other ways yeah we're raking it in absolutely and i don't know if you heard the last caller mention that with Joni taylor and the basket women's basketball team that could be a candidate for like an outdoor Kyle Field experience because that's kind of a program on the rise at A&M, pushing South Carolina, the best team in the country, to the brink in the tournament. And there's momentum there. And Joni Taylor is a very respected name. She was on the, the search committee Georgia. for the AD. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
And she was with Georgia, and she did a really good job with Georgia. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that there's potential there that you could push, and he brings that pedigree in. So, yeah, there's a lot of avenues he could explore there. And that would be huge not only for the event itself, selling tickets, putting butts in the seats for the event, but just generating more buzz about these other, I guess, secondary sporting programs at A&M. So I, I think that's stuff that's going to be explored, man. I really do. It's a good point. I, it's just – Right now, more or less, like, I'm not a basketball fan. Like, I keep up with A&M basketball. Yeah. But more or less, I am the baseball guy right now. Like, I'm watching the baseball team, and they yes. are ridiculous. Dude. They, yeah. they look poised, like, you know, the Sam Houston game or the game before that. They just look poised, and they're just not scared. Exactly, man. I mean, they're getting down in counts. They're getting down on counts pitching and offensively, and they're still finding a way to stay in, to scrape, to fight. It's been really impressive, and just the offense overall is amazing. Pitching over the last two games, a little scary going into SEC play, but we're going to get kind of a clean slate with the top guys going into the series. So, man, if you can win the series versus Florida or somehow sweep, and I know Florida's kind of on a, on a downhill, just the confidence from that, man, on the road, that I mean, you're looking at a special year potentially. The, my thing is, is with SEC baseball, it's it's going to be a trudge. Like, do I think we're going to go thirty six and zero? No, no way. Yeah. But if we can just win series, yes, it'd be great. Florida is our good start. You know, you always got to worry about Vanderbilt. Arkansas looks really good this year. Yep. They kind of scare me on our bats with our pitching being suspect from time to time. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just like I, I'm excited for ba baseball this year, but I do have batter daggy syndrome, <laughs> we all and so do. there's that part of me. Yeah, there's that part of me. It's like it, it's gonna collapse. Right. I just I just want to be, do better than Texas. Yeah, that's all. That's hey, we got the win nine to two, baby. Yeah, we got the win. Yeah, that's exactly. all I cared about. Exactly, exactly. The last time and seeing all the. On. Seeing all the Texas fans, you know, tweet out just like, "Oh, look at your strength schedule." Don't care. We beat you. Yeah, exactly. And you weren't even our toughest game yet. Rhode Island put up a better fight. So we have all that. Yeah, Rhode game. Island scared the piss out of me. Dude, I know. I was Sorry so if I cussed. No, you can cuss. We have, yeah, no, people drop F-bombs. It's all good. I don't cuss that much, but it doesn't matter. It's fine. Um, yeah, dude, I was in the, I was, I was about to go like grocery shopping after we went up in that game. Then we went down. I sat in my truck and just watched like on pins and needles watching the end of that game. That was, that was scary. And then, of course, giving up the lead against Sam Houston as well. Yeah, man. It, it, it's, it's, it's a bad two games to go into SEC play with, but offensively still, I, still pretty solid, I mean, through both games anyway. so. Do you follow uh, Hayden Schott on Twitter? I, I don't follow him yet, but I've seen some of his handiwork. I saw him sitting man. next to Jace on the airplane today. Yes, like that's the thing is you those are the little things of he's still making jokes whenever it's like, hey, man, we shouldn't have been that close against Rhode Island. Yeah. But he's still like you just see him loose. Yeah. Yeah. That's poise right there. Exactly. And it really feels like we have some I mean, I think it's obvious we have several major leaguers on this team right now. So we have a team. Oh, of yeah. Future professionals. All the same. It really. I mean, it has to pan out, battered Aggie syndrome. I'm not trying to jinx us, but it really feels like it has the makings of that kind of a team. But, yeah, man, and he hit, he hit the walk-off, right? Didn't he hit the walk-off versus Rhode Island? Uh, Rhode Island, yeah, he hit that uh, little single. Yeah, the, the walk-off single yeah. where the guy dove for it and couldn't get it, yes. And then he's cracking jokes. He's cracking jokes in the post-game presser. It's awesome, man. Yeah, him and then Jace and Braden and uh, what's the freshman's name who leads off? He's – Oh, the shortstop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it starts with a G. It's like an Italian name almost. Yes, yes. I'm probably wrong, but every time I see it, I'm like, I can't say that name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. These guys are all – these have these guys have major professional potential. And then the rest of the lineup's pretty damn good too. I mean, yeah. It's, it's stacked. It's, it almost feels like – oh, have fun. It almost feels like I, you're a Houston fan, right? Or uh, Astros fan? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, a, I'm an Astro. I mean, I was diehard. I'm more of a casual fan now. But yes, yes. See, I'm a Rangers fan, and I've, you know, I've talked to people. I was like, this team feels like the Rangers this year, where the pitcher can be suspect. That's fine, but we're going to lay in runs in one inning. Yeah, keep you in games, no matter and, what. Yep. Yeah, just keep us in games to the very end, and then we're like, yeah, there, here we go. Exactly. But I mean. 
sorry to sw- switch subjects, but like Mike Elko. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're seeing like Texas A&M athletics drop videos of all the coaches and all their talking, you know, and all their yelling. I'm just so excited. Like I'm, I'm ready to get hurt, but at the same point, I'm like, this could be the year. Do you see 10 wins? Dude. Okay. I don't know how much of me you've watched, but this is what I'm saying. And this is my quote for now until I learn more about the team. I, I, I've seen it. Like, yeah, we, we should have expectations, but at the same point in time, like, yeah, still just, here's where I'm at. Just, there are, I think there are 12 freaking wins on this schedule, man. I think every game on this schedule is a winnable game for Texas A&M as I know it right now. But I also see six potential losses on this schedule. Yeah. You have your tough games at home. It's kind of ideal. You don't have any juggernauts, if you will, on the schedule. You don't have a Georgia. You don't have a Bama, uh, a, a Saban-led Bama. You know what I mean? You have yeah. all your tough games at home and your manageable SEC games on the road. So – it's pretty manageable across the board. I think every game A and M has a okay. chance in, but the the season. What scares me about the season and it, is it hits you so early and often. You know, opening with Notre Dame. It's Mizzou, Notre Dame. Even, Mizzou scares me the most. Okay. Florida and Mizzou are my my scariest ones. You feel good about like Notre Dame? a lot of people are like uh, Notre Dame. That's just a big team, but also you've got Mizzou and Florida. Yeah. Everyone's like, Florida's on the down climb, but it's still the swamp. And Mizzou, everyone's like, I don't know if that was a one and off, or I'm just scared of those three games in particular. And, of course, Texas, it doesn't matter if we, you know, lose every game. Yeah. We could win the Texas game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel the same way. Yeah, and the thing about Florida, it's the swamp, like you said. They're still a top 20 talent team in the country. People are just down on them because they have a schedule versus teams better than them down the home stretch of the year. I think it's like seven top 15 teams to close the year out. And the A&M's a must-win game for them at home. So we're going to get their Oh, most shot. definitely. It's going to be early in Elko's tenure. Notre Dame, I agree that I don't think Notre Dame on the field is the worst matchup for A&M. I think it's probably a good matchup for A&M. It's just you're fielding a whole new coaching staff and team with all the portal guys and new players on defense and whatever. Game one versus Notre Dame, who's like in year three of, um, I forget, blinking on coaching. Yeah, what's his name? Um, what? Yeah. You know, y'all know who I mean. I'm, I blink on names all the time. That's that's a trend here. Drew blinks on names. It's all good. We know who we're talking about. Their coach. But yes, so yeah, I think there's the sky's the limit. There is so much opportunity on this schedule. I think A&M has the troops to do it. It's just how quickly can they put Elko and his football program together versus a manageable but not easy schedule. So I'm going to put your feet to the fire real quick. Let's do it. What's a, what's a success for Elko in his first season? A success is nine, nine or more wins. Nine or more is a success. Nine. Eight is acceptable but not, not the preference. Eight is like, okay, we're still in wait and see mode. Seven is bad. I don't want to be at seven yeah. anymore. I think A&M is a better program than that. I think A&M in a down year is an eight-win team at worst. And I think year one, eight wins is acceptable. The next year after that, you know, we're looking at nine plus. But, you know, I, I really ne- have The my next year, nine it's or 10. ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have my hopes at nine or ten, and I think that's very attainable. I, I Yeah. I'm, I'll put my – you know, we're going to get more info through spring, obviously, and workouts throughout summer. We'll get glimpses, then obviously through fall camp. And I'll put out my official prediction, but I think right now – if I were to put my feet to the absolute fire, I'd be. I think I would put money on eight or nine. Is where I'm at. Uh, for me, it'd be nine. Okay. Like nine wins is an absolute success. You've got a lot of turnover. You know, brand new coaching staff. Like, what? We only re- retained what two coaches yeah. from the Jimbo era. Yeah, yeah. It's Tony Gerard Eddy, who was like an assistant, not even a named assistant. He was like a maybe a grad assistant. Now he's been promoted to a coach. And then BGA, I think Brian Gross Arminio, I think he was on the staff before, and I think that's I think that's it. So yeah, and these weren't even mainstays, and these were these were lesser coaches back then, and they've kind of moved up. Yeah, yeah, it's so. totally new, new philosophies, new playbook, new everything. But you know. I don't know how much you pay attention to Tex Ags. It sounds like from the player interviews that there's definitely a new mindset that's being pushed amongst these players, and it's like the win or die attitude. It's it's everything is. Oh, you hear? 
you can hear from them talking on yes. the Texas interviews. It's that, that blue collar mentality of we're here to do our work. And I think our best hire was our strength and conditioning coach. I was about to say this. Yep. That was our best hire. And you can see it already. You like, you see the pictures in the videos that they release out and you're just like, Holy shit. I know. They this gotta, is different. You gotta stop sending those out, man. They're getting me a little bit too hype with those videos. Every time they Yeah, that's out, the reason like, why. Yeah, yeah. They're awesome, man. He's awesome. I mean, obviously strength and conditioning, that's the guy that touches every aspect of your football team. That's the guy. Right? Yeah. He's such an underrated position coach, and I think nowadays we're we're seeing the importance of it. Especially the last few years under Jimbo, we felt what maybe having a deficiency there felt like with the injuries and it felt like lack of mental toughness amongst the team. That's changing. Yeah. Uh, all right, man. Well, I got to head out. It was good talking to you. Hey, man. Yeah, thanks for calling in. Please call in again. That was good stuff. Oh, yeah. All right, man. Later. Have a good night. That was James from Moody, Texas. Good to hear from James. First-time caller. We got a first-time caller tonight, guys. That always feels good. Rolly says the name we missed was Grahovich. That's right. That's right. Dude, That how is that guy a freshman, man? It's crazy. Built like a linebacker. Yes, absolutely. All right, let's get to the last caller tonight that I'm going to get out of here, guys. It's been it's been fun tonight. We started with the game. Now we're going to get into Theo. We're going to close things out. All righty, Theo. Last caller of the night, man. How you doing, Theo? Bro, I just got over a 24-hour stomach bug. Stop getting no sick, fun. man. <laughs> I can't help it. I have two kids. <laughs> oh, that'll, all that'll do it. Grade school. That'll do it. They're bringing it right to you. That'll bring it right to you, man. <laughs> Well, hey, man, I hope it didn't get you too down. We've had some we've had some good Aggie stuff over the last few days, including a basketball win today. Were you watching? Uh, I didn't get to watch. I was watching uh, The Rise of Gru with the kiddos. But, oh, nice. Um, I kept up with it and kind of glanced at it and saw that we won. It's a much-needed win. Um, I really feel like it puts us in the tournament. Um, you think we're in? Which uh, I think – we. If we're not in, something's seriously wrong. What's the point of having such a hard um, out-of-conference out of schedule if you're not going to get in on that? Here's my fear, Theo. My, my fear is we're, we're already not getting love from the pull projectors. We're already, we're already not getting love there. It's a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately league. And, yes, we, went, we got hot for, like, the last four or five games but, or whatever it was. What did we win, like, four to close the year out? But, We've won four straight now. Yeah, four straight now, which is great. You're, you're peaking at the right time, but I fear that we peaked a little bit too late, and those losses to Arkansas and to Vandy are what kill us. I, I, here's the thing. I'm nervous about that, and I'm saying we need to get to the championship to get in. Okay. That's well, where I'm at. In reality, for me, it's go win the championship and then not put in anyone's hands. That, that but... would be amazing. Yeah. That's what I – yeah. Dude, can you imagine get an SEC championship? Oh. Could you imagine what that would do for Buzz? Oh, he like, needs it, man. You're a Buzz guy, right? You're still you you like Buzz. I'm a I'm a I I like Buzz, but I'm more of a It's not a Buzz problem. If that makes sense. Yeah, you're in a, it's an investment problem in the program, right? Correct. Um I definitely looking see that. at Looking at these other programs throughout the SEC that we compete with, heck, I would even Vanderbilt's gym looks better than Reed's Arena right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And they're they're bottom tier. Right. Um, in the league. So how could that be the case when we're we're supposed to expect consistent tournament teams out of guys that's a great point that's a great point and i I do think that's one of the key factors at play but max the earlier caller brought up a couple good points so with schloss i feel like he's a future he's part of the future of a&m it feels like i I feel like a&m baseball is on the cusp of becoming one of the best baseball programs in the country if they're able to extend expand bluebell park by a few thousand seats i think uh, i think we're looking at a at a top potentially top tier baseball program and I think Schloss is one of the guys that's the future of A&M athletics. But I think what he does well is he puts pressure on the athletic department for expansions. And I don't think we see that from Buzz. And I don't know if that's oh, something that happens behind the scenes. Maybe he's just not public with it. Oh, it's definitely there from Buzz. 
You think it is? He for, talks, he's talked about it. He, he's talked about it with David Nuno on on okay. text ags in the mornings, um, in regards to not having uh, basketball facilities, and having players having their own gym and, um, that kind of stuff. He's talked about being behind in terms of the facilities for a legit top twenty five basketball player. Well, that's good to hear. And see, and. and that's what we got to figure out what we want. Do we want a top 25 basketball program and a top 25 baseball program and a top 25 football program and a top 25, you know, women's basketball program, or are we all going to be focused on just football, which is what we are at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, be able to spread some of this stuff around. Right. And that's one thing I like about the new athletic director is when I dug into his past, he has done very well in terms of getting um, outside sources of revenue to develop facilities for schools, like when he was at Omaha. Um, It sucks that he had to cut football and wrestling, but they were going to pull them down in terms of an athletic budget. Yep. And in turn, he was able to get them a new basketball gym, a new baseball field, a new softball field, a new soccer field, and a they started a swimming and diving program. Yep. Yep. So um, I think he's going to be really good at being able to pull out um, private sources and stuff like that to help put in these programs. And then hopefully that gets us where we're going. My thing is, is we need to be all in on basketball if we expect basketball to be top 25 right now we treat it like it's a top 50 team or a top 75 program and we expect it to the... be a top 20 team as a fan base exactly yeah yeah that's and absolutely that's, true that's... And that's that's apparent if you look at the facilities if you look at reed it's very apparent that it's not given that that love but to be fair we've talked about it on the show before a&m has definitely gone through an evolution since 2012 a&m has definitely seen financial heights for the, the athletic department that it hasn't seen before over the last 10 years or so. And, and we haven't had a consistent athletic director and we Correct. haven't had a consistent president. Correct. So really, um, I'm hoping with the hiring of, of our president, um, I, I'm blanking his name at Welsh. the moment. Welsh. And what he's done in the military and how he's been able to budget um, being under in, in the Pentagon and stuff like that. Yep. Um, to go along with this athletic director and these coaches that push their teams to be more consistent, even though they may not always be, yep. but push these teams to be the best they can be. I really think that we're in a good spot going forward. Yeah. Now, will we be able to, as a fan base, accept that we're not quite there yet. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm wondering, can you have a future? I mean, so, uh, okay, so here's a couple thoughts. So A&M has put in the work already for the football facilities, I think. And, of course, Mm -hmm. you always have to be evolving, but I think we're set up for the next five to ten years for sure Mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, that right. money's been spent. I mean, I'm sure they're still fundraising. I'm sure they're still that that's been done. That's that's been budgeted mm-hmm. out. That's done. We're looking good there. Now you're looking at baseball. I think that's the mm-hmm. next step. I think you do what what is the snowball approach? I think the baseball needs the least amount of love to get to that to that next to that next step, right? Well, I think, baseball's gonna baseball's supposed to uh, break ground in July. So is that official or, or is that gonna change without Bjork? That's been put out by Ross or not Ross but um by Welsh by Welsh and also by Slosh okay well I hope so because that's the next level I, I love Bluebell Park it's beautiful right it doesn't need an overhaul mm-hmm. it needs more seats is that is that would you say that's right uh, cr- yeah yeah um I, but here's the issue and Slosh has talked about it they practice across right campus Right. Their like their um their locker room is across campus. Right. So what 
I would really like to see, um, and and you will you'll probably have to look it up, but you need to take a look at East Texas Baptist University's baseball and softball fields, and the way they've built up that area. It's a much smaller dimension, et cetera. It's just make it bigger, but the baseball and softball fields are like back to back to each other. In the middle there is um, multiple student baseball softball buildings right and then it's efficient both yeah it's efficient and then both stadiums have clubhouses for the athletes there wow okay yeah that makes a lot of sense but there it's like individual clubhouses their own practice field individual locker rooms but it's all in the same building same complex right yeah and it, it it looks really nice the way they did it um and something like that would be awesome at a&m to where you can support both programs at the same time if you need to, if you want it to. Like, yeah. When we have like the double headers, we have like a softball and a baseball game going off at the same time. You can sit in a certain seat in the baseball field and watch the softball field if you wanted to, or vice versa. Yeah. You know what I mean? The only problem is, I, be... I imagine their stadiums are a little bit smaller and it'd be a little bit more of an endeavor to, to get that done at AM. But from an efficiency standpoint and a long term standpoint, it does seem ideal. We're engineering school. We can do anything we want <laughs> as long as we put our minds to it. You got the right people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so I, I would love to see that. Um, so do you know what they're breaking ground on exactly? Because, I, I mean, I, I knew about this, but I don't think I've looked into the exact details. He didn't really say. He hasn't okay. really said what he's breaking Well, I'd, I'd love to see what that on. is, and I would love to see if if, um, if Trev can make any kind of input on this in a short time here. But I guess my overall right. – I'll keep going into this. So it looks like that's going to get done. But beyond that, not only are you having to navigate facilities, you're also having to allocate a certain amount of funds to NIL now, which is not only competitive, but it's expected, right? It's not only something you have to be competitive with, but it's it's baseline now, NIL. And not just that, but NIL for each individual program. Exactly. We're behind in basketball NIL compared to like the Tennessees and the Auburns and the Alabamas, and, heck, even LSU is ahead of us in terms of that. Yes. Florida is ahead of us in terms of that. Look at what South Carolina did in terms of that. Yep, and I think it's just because of our extreme heavy investment into football under Jimbo. I think that's what it's been, right? Plus, before Jimbo, we right. had the, the, the house that Johnny built be built. We had all that, the post-Johnny ripple effect, and then we had Jimbo, and Jimbo had his plans and his demands and everything. So all the money's been going there, including to NIL. We'll cite the 2022 recruiting class. We were the first ones into the collective game, first ones into the big NIL game. Football is like on a mountaintop, and everything else needs to catch up. Mm-hmm. But what is the trickle effect of NIL and football alone? And not only that, I mean, you got to bring it up. You're still paying Jimbo, of course, and however much that, that eats up the budget, that's there too. But I think the biggest factor here is just NIL for every sport now. How much does that slow down your development? How much can how much more donors how many more donor dollars do you need to get as an AD, knowing that you have to do NIL for all these sports? And I don't even know, is it trickling into women's sports too? Are these other sports getting NIL too? I'm sure yes. it's a factor. So it's everywhere. Yes. So does that slow down your development? Are you just having to get more donors? I don't know. That's something I need to see play out. That and that's that's again, that's something I love seeing from the A D. Trev, yes. Um, Trev, look at what he did for Lincoln of Nebraska and how quickly he was able to get um, their NIL game in order to actually get a decent, like, I know someone who's a Nebraska basketball fan and he hated basketball season, even though he was a fan of the team because they weren't competitive, even in the Big 12, even in the Big 10, even in the Big 8. When it came to basketball, they could not compete. But then he went. But then he was able to keep Hoiberg yeah. and upped their NIL game through private donations and private stuff. Yeah, that he was able to get them to actually be a tournament team this year. Yep, for like the second time in like thirty years. Yeah, yeah, they're not a basketball school. Yeah, so feeling that and seeing that. Um, I just, I, I, I have high hopes for what Trev can do. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, man. He's going to have a lot more tools at his disposal. He's going to have a much more... I, I think it's not perfect at A&M, but it, it seems like it's in a better position than... As far as the overall administration, then where Nebraska is not having a president, having financial issues across the university, it does seem like he's going to be jumping into a better situation. What do you think uh, about people that are saying that this is a stepping stone for him, that he's looking to rise, and that maybe a and not a final destination? We had um, Max on here, who's a neutral third party. He, he roots for A&M, but he's kind of, you know, admitting if you want to be at the highest level of AD, you go to a more of a power player in the sport a program that's at the, at the, at the, at the main table of the politics of sports and beyond. Do you think that we're able to retain Alberts for an extended period of time? Cause I think that's a such a huge factor. We need some stability there. Uh, it all, I, I, I can't tell you that without knowing the person. Yeah. yeah. Because it all depends on what he wants to do at A&M. Yeah. We could absolutely be that factor that these people are talking about these ADs wanting to go to. Yeah. However, it is going to take them to stay here for a while to do it. And not only is it going to take them to stay here a while to do it, but he's going to have to want to do it. Right. Um, if he doesn't want to do something like that, then I understand. Yep. You know, I can't blame him. Um, Cause I'm an ambitious person myself. I'm always going to look for, um, my best fit and how I can grow and develop into the next position if I can. Yep. Um, and that's quite and, often and, moving that it's quite often that the, the, the best, the best solution for accelerated growth is moving. But I think AM is in a unique position where there's so much room for growth within. Exactly where there can be growth within if he wants to take the time to do that and develop that. And, um, um, that's going to be on that's going to be on him to think about yes and my hope would be that with this interview process with this committee that this was addressed that this was a, this was a point of emphasis within the interview process and that's something that they tried to vet out from the personalities that they were they were talking to and I, I would really hope that that's part of the reasoning for getting them here that that would be my hope that they're looking for a longer term kind of deal here and i think that's always the goal everywhere but you never know man you, you're right though it's all about the person he did stay at omaha for quite a while he was there for like 12 years so anyway that's that's it for the ad talk i want to get your thoughts real quick before we end the show tonight the baseball series versus florida this weekend do you have what do you have us doing this weekend uh I'm in a place with baseball where it's just take it a day and a game at a time. Um, You're just having fun with it. Uh, just sit back and enjoy it because how often is it that we have a program or a team like this that we can just sit back and enjoy yeah. as it comes? That's a great point. Um, so that's that's just how I'm going to take it. And, um, I, expect to, I expect this to win. I expect it to be a competitive game, but yeah. – um, I trust who we have out there. I love who we have out there. Um, and those kids are balling. They're not afraid of anything. They're grinders. So I hope Florida is ready to be <laughs> in some grinded out moments. Dig and, them and in the bounce. deep waters. Drown them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because that's exactly what we do. Um, and it doesn't matter who it is against, and it doesn't matter what the score is. We're not going outside of our approach to make you feel like you have a, a head start over us or anything like that. Nice. We're going to grind you out bat to bat, and however that goes, that goes. Um, yep. Fun team to watch, I, I, man. It's, just, it's not, not just obviously on the field. We're looking at a high-level baseball team. But the camaraderie, the off the field, the interviews, everything about this team is freaking fun right now. So that's a mm -hmm. really good point, just to sit back and enjoy what we're having right now. You never know how long you're going to have it. You never know what next season brings. We just got to live in the moment right now because this, this is a damn fun team and a fun baseball season. So that, that's, that's good stuff, Theo. Well, anything you want to close out with tonight? We're going to have you close the show tonight, and I'll get into a couple comments. We'll get out of here. Um. Actually, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head right now. Like, the spring I, I start next week. Spring football. 
I think they're on. Yes. I think they're on break right now. They didn't do the spring break in the middle of spring football. I think they start next week and they go straight to the spring game. Yeah. Okay. So well, they go all the way to to the spring game. Yep. Yep. So there's no break in the middle. I don't know. I think the break in the middle is kind of cool to like make sure your players don't go out and just die in spring break because you know how college kids get partying in spring break. It's like a pastime. Right. You know? Go on to South Padre, whatever the spring break destination is for college. I don't even know. Is it Port A, South, San Padre? Is that, is that high school? I don't even know. But, yeah, I think uh, a lot of players are training right now. I don't know if you saw Ruben Owen's dad says he's trying to get to 215 by the time the season starts. We saw Solomon Williams looking like a freaking college junior as a high Already? school senior right now. Did you see that video of him today? That's ridiculous, bro. I know. This is a breakout I, I player. That. We keep forgetting to bring him up. I mean, but we haven't forgotten. This guy could play year one. I saw that and I was like, what are they feeding these kids? Like, what in the world? Like, I can never imagine being that big that at that age. Um, it yeah, just yeah. it kind of blew me away when I saw that. I was like, holy the moly, what? I know. Wow. I'm looking at it thinking, damn, this is a freshman. And then I realized, no, this is a high schooler. This is crazy. This guy's not even in the college. Is he? He Was, was he an early enrollee? Uh, I believe he is. But okay, I, that's good. That's even scarier. When you get those guys. I'm early, not hundred percent sure. Yeah, yeah. Regardless, he's in a good place. Team's in a good place. We'll start looking at storylines for spring starting next week. And Thea said I was gonna put out a video early on Monday about some spring storylines that I'll be looking out for. So, I guess I'll talk to you next time, and we'll maybe have some spring nuggets to go over, and then maybe we'll talk about that Florida series. Look forward to it. And hey, y'all, hit those likes, man. Help him. With this algorithm and stuff, we get that going for him. Thanks, Theo. Appreciate it, man. Well, you have a great night, Theo. Thanks for jumping on. You too. All right. That was Theo. We had some good callers tonight, guys. Appreciate everyone for calling in. Max, James, Theo, you guys were awesome. Max wants to see the football ultras from Brazil. That's like their uh, that's like their hype section, right? Let me see if I can find an image. These guys are crazy. These are like the, the spirit section or whatever you would call it, the, the insane – I mean, if you, if I think the closest thing to like, someone said this recently, I forget who, but the closest thing to like soccer crowds in American sports is college football crowds. But I think that soccer crowds are even, they're essentially a giant student section. If you look at the intensity of a student section in college football, it's like that throughout most of the stadium for these, for these soccer games, these premier league, these big time national, uh, national teams. But, yeah, you can see, like, these crazy environments that these football teams bring. And imagine if they're able to bring stuff like this to Kyle Field is what Max is saying. Oh, man, I would love to see that. Let's see what else you guys are saying before we get out of here. Good show tonight. Got through some basketball stuff. Got through the AD. And then next week we'll be hopefully getting to some spring nuggets. Roly says that uh, Lenardi has us in. I didn't know that. I saw a few brackets earlier that didn't have us in. But uh, maybe is this after the win tonight? Because this is awesome. If Lenardi has us in, that's a that's a huge step. So does losing not factor against that? I mean, that's a good – we're in a good place then if we're in now after one win. If we can snag two wins, that would be some insurance at this point. I hope we can get that. Tough non-con schedule with several big wins. A&M wins tonight. We beat Kentucky again tomorrow. We're in the tourney. Beat Kentucky and we're in. I love it. We can do it. We can do it. Done it before. Space Jesus says we should have bleacher seatings in the outfield like they have a lot of MLB stadiums. Absolutely. We can do more than 7,000 in big games. We had 7,000 versus Sam Houston on a Tuesday. How many can we have for conference games on a Saturday or a Friday or even a Sunday? 17-0, baby. 17-0, SB Hustler. Terry Bussey, fan club president. Good to have the fan club president in here. You talking about Bussy or you talking about Solomon Williams? Because both are getting me excited at this point, SB Hustler. Student sections don't march through college towns chanting for their team before games like the Ultras would hours before the game. Yeah, I think I, I think soccer is another level above. It's crazy. I think they say that it's not even safe for you to bring your family to certain matchups. Overall, like as a general concept, there's no like safe, quiet alumni section in some of these Premier League games. Yeah. They're another level. The closest thing is college football, but even that's another level. Football will always be top dog in every regard, but baseball, softball, women's basketball, soccer, tennis, track and field, equestrian, etc. There's no reason we can't compete regularly in all sports. I totally agree. Just needs a little bit more love from hopefully the administration donors and the new AD. But all right, guys, it was a good show tonight. 
I appreciate you guys tuning in. Next week, we're going to start talking about hopefully some spring storylines. I'm going to put out a video, a more concise video than what we did a couple weeks ago about my spring watch list on Monday. So look out for that. Until then, guys, I'll see you. Thanks for being here. Like and subscribe. Gig them.